This is my filterless, self-cleaning aquarium, a setup where plants and microorganisms take care of the vast majority of the maintenance requirements for me. I've published a full article explaining exactly how this system works, which I'll link to in the description, but this is a quick overview. Fast-grown plants play a key role absorbing ammonium as a nutrient source, helping to prevent the buildup of toxic ammonia and nitrite. Once ammonium levels drop, they switch over to using the nitrate as their nutrient source, which helps keep that under control, reducing the need for water changes. These plants also take in various dissolved solid ions to fuel their growth, which naturally helps manage TDS levels, minimising water changes even further. At the same time, microorganisms, shrimp and snails break down decaying plant matter, fish waste and leftover food, mineralising the nutrients in those back into the water column for the plants to utilise so there's no need to gravel vacuum either. This is the month for update and while there have been a few changes, the tank is really starting to come together. I want to start with the celestial pearl danio fish that I'm keeping in the tank. These little guys seem to really be enjoying the slightly cooler water temperatures now that we are past the summer months and as usual they have been breeding a lot. Last winter I kept these in an unheated room temperature tank that dropped to 18 degrees Celsius or 64 degrees Fahrenheit during the winter and they did perfectly fine, no issues at all, which does kind of make sense because they are from one of the cooler tropical regions in the wild. Because of that, I do think they may actually prefer closer to their current water temperature, which is 22 degrees Celsius or 72 degrees Fahrenheit that the tank's heater is maintaining for their breeding because their activity levels really have spiked. In last month's update, I mentioned that I spotted what looked like a tiny little baby fish that was probably too small to have come from the previous tank when I moved the adults and babies over to this one. Now I'm not sure if it was the same baby fish or a different one but I've definitely seen at least one more fish in this tank and it is definitely too small so there are some of the eggs that are being produced in this tank hatching in here. Due to how rapidly the fish move around in this tank you may not be able to see it in the video clips but there's at least three different males showing off their breeding colours right now constantly competing with each other to become the dominant male and breed with all of the females. But that also means that there is a lot of rapid back and forth due to tail fanning and chasing each other to try and become the dominant male in the tank which does make it difficult to see the fish well. Other than that though, all of the fish in here seem really happy and really healthy. But if they do keep breeding at this rate I will probably have to rehome some of them because I moved 17 of them over from their old tank into this 45 litre or 12 US gallon tank and with new babies showing up it is going to get crammed quick. Thankfully it is very easy to give Celestial Pearl Danios away and one of my friends has wanted some for a while so I've got a good home waiting for them. Moving on to the shrimp and I did unfortunately lose one of the orange Neo Caradinas this month but I'm pretty sure it was due to natural causes. I haven't lost any more since then and I have seen fresh molts in the tank after that so I don't think it's an issue with molten. I'll talk about this more later in the video but I did have a slight ammonia spike in the tank this month but that happened after I lost that shrimp so I don't think the two events are related in any way. I know I've mentioned this in a previous update for this tank but I'm convinced that all of the Neo Caradina shrimp in this tank are female. I've seen countless orange Neo Caradina shrimp in this tank carrying eggs in their ovaries at their saddled stage of the pregnancy process but I've never seen any of them carrying eggs in their pleopods at the buried stage so I don't think there's a male in here to fertilise them. If you're new to the hobby that might sound a little odd because of how many Neo Caradina shrimp I added to this tank but it can be more common than people realise because females are usually more colourful than males so it is what naturally catches the eye and the breeders send a lot of them out. I had the exact same situation with my old colony of orange Neo Caradina shrimp last year or the year before but once I added some males they started breeding quickly. So I am planning to pick up another batch of around 10 orange Neo Caradina shrimp next time I put a shrimp order in to hopefully get some males in the tank to get them breeding. As for the Armano shrimp, just like in all of my other tanks they generally stay hidden when the tank lights are on unless it's feeding time. I have spotted some of my Armano shrimp in here picking at the staghorn algae in the tank but I'll talk more about that later in the video. Moving on to the plants and I've decided to remove the house plants that were sitting on the rim of this tank. 
as I mentioned last month, I just think they were taking up too many of the nutrients in the water column since they have easy access to atmospheric CO2, allowing them to grow far quicker than my submerged plants and now compete them for nutrients. I've potted the Tradescantia plant separately so in the future once it grows out I can take cuttings from it for my other tanks and I moved the Fetonia over to one of my other aquariums since it has a far lower growth rate or so shouldn't cause any problems. I did also decide to remove the USB water pump early in the month because the excess nutrients or at least the water soluble nutrients should have been dissipated out of the substrate. As I mentioned last month, the Lagenendra Meboldii Red still hadn't taken off in this tank and I honestly think it was due to the houseplants just taking so many nutrients out of the water column. While I do think it probably would have bounced back eventually, I already have this plant thriving in other tanks and since I am leaning more into the aquatic plant collecting side of the hobby, I just decided to remove it from this one and replace it with something different. Now you can see some detritus being stirred up off the substrate as I remove these plants but this level is completely normal with this type of setup, it shouldn't get any worse than this moving forward. The waste eating bacteria colonies have built up and there'll always be some detritus at various levels of decomposition re releasing the trapped nutrients into the water column. After removing those plants I decided to add some Cryptochorine Wentii Green to that planting area. Now I do already have Crypt Wentii Green in another tank but it is kind of in the mid ground and difficult to see so I decided to put it here in a more prominent position so I can actually see it. Unfortunately the following day I did notice a very small ammonia spike in the tank probably due to some of the topsoil being pulled up into the water column when I removed the Lagenandra. To help stabilise things as quickly as possible without doing a water change I re-added the USB water pump to the tank to get some water flow going and push that ammonia into the plant so they can naturally purify it. A few hours later I rechecked the water parameters and everything was back to normal but if there was still a detectable hit by this stage I would have done a water change. As I mentioned earlier some of the plants are seemingly having some nutrient issues. The main one is the Echnodorus tropica that's starting to have some of its leaves melt away because of the side effects of the house plants given undetectable nitrogen levels and using up a lot of the other nutrients in here too. My current thinking is to just trim away those decaying leaves and it should make a full recovery over the coming month or two. Unfortunately the Ulfananthera Renekii Mini on the other hand has definitely seen better days. Now this is a medium difficulty plant anyway so I probably shouldn't have put it in this tank but between that, the lack of nutrients due to the house plants and the limited light penetration that I'll touch on later, it's really been struggling. I am thinking of just removing it from the tank and I'll probably replace it with some of the spare Cryptochore Nurii I'll have from another tank I'm currently building as that's far easier to grow and I already have it in the mid ground of this tank so I know it'll do well. Moving on and we get to the Staghorn Algae and I do think there was a little bit of Blackbeard Algae mixed in there too, that's very common with my tanks, I usually get both of them rather than just one or the other. This has been my main focus for the tank this month but I chose natural methods so it's taken very little effort from me to deal with it. I do want to switch to an older clip of the tank from about 4 weeks ago just to show you how bad the algae actually got at its peak. As you can see there's a lot more algae back then especially on the top of the plants in the left hand side and some in the foreground but things have gotten a lot better in just 4 weeks. This is what the tank is looking like today and you can see there's been a huge improvement. Most of the algae on the left and top of the tank is completely gone. There is still a little bit in the foreground but it's definitely on its way out and the heavily algae infected area on the right hand side is also starting to come under control. As I mentioned last month there are chemical treatments available on the market that can help speed up this process. Personally I just rely on natural methods with this type of tank. As you can see in this clip from about a week ago I've just let my Salvinia Minima take over the surface of the tank and basically form a surface carpet of floating plants. Not only can this help keep nutrient levels more stable for the tank but the main thing is it can also block out a lot of light which can help cause the algae to melt quickly. So jumping back to the tank today and as you can see I have removed about two thirds of the salvinia just because the algae is under control but I'm monitoring it closely and I probably will let this salvinia grow out over the next couple of weeks and cover the surface once more just to try and get rid of the last of it and then from then on 
I'll probably keep 25% of the surface with salvinier on it. As I mentioned earlier, I have noticed my Armano shrimp picking at the remaining staghorn algae in the tank this month, but I do want to clarify, I do think that that staghorn algae was already into its melt stage, so the fibres were a lot softer and easier for the shrimp to eat. It is very rare that I see them eat the healthy staghorn algae in my tanks. Moving on and we get to water parameters and with this type of tank where it's using topsoil as its nutrient layer that is then capped with fine gravel, the first three months are usually very volatile and it's not necessarily toxic compounds, there's a lot of water soluble nutrients that's released from the soil into the water column. But those water soluble nutrients do eventually dissipate in around month four which is what this video is focusing on, things do start to become far more stable. So, moving forward, I do want to start tracking the water parameters in each update for this tank moving forward because things should be stable and it should give a good idea of what other people can expect with their own versions of this tank. So, starting with the nitrogen compounds and as you can see, the toxic ammonia and toxic nitrite are both undetectable which is exactly what we want to keep our fish, shrimp, snails and plants safe. The nitrate, which is far less toxic, is sitting around 5 ppm and that's right where I want it because it does give me a visual indicator on my test kit that there's nitrogen compounds in there for the plants to use for nutrients, but it's nowhere near high enough to cause any problems because nitrate is far less toxic than ammonia and nitrite. Moving on to total dissolved solids and I'm getting a reading of 145 on my TDS pen. Personally, I'm not a big fan of TDS readings unless you're using a reverse osmosis pump to get rid of everything out of your water and then target remineralizing it so you know exactly what's in there. But there is a persistent myth in the hobby that if you only top off the water instead of doing full partial water changes, which I've done for month four and plan to keep doing moving forward unless there's an emergency, the, th the myth says that the TDS levels will keep increasing to dangerous levels. But in my experience, that is not true in any way, provided the tank has fast grown plants in it. I have tanks that are running very similar systems to the tank featured in this video that are over a year and a half old now, and none of their TDS levels have ever been above 250. That's because the plants are consistently filtering out those potentially toxic ions and using them up as nutrients, while also removing non-nutrient ions and locking them away via hyperaccumulation. Now I do plan to start tracking GH and KH for this tank but as you can see in the top right my GH test solution actually expired a year ago. I only realised that said 2025 when I went to test it today but it has smudged and it actually says 2024. So I will be ordering a fresh GHKH test kit ready for next month but this might be why it's looked like my GH levels have remained steady in all of my tanks without me adding mineral salts or anything like that to a lot of them because it was starting to puzzle me. Anyway guys, that brings the video to an end. I hope it's been helpful. Thanks for watching and good luck with your planted tanks.